Uh, okay, uh, it's on, it's on. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, our topic is in danger of fragmenting digital trade. Uh, we will talk about China's role in the WTO plurilateral negotiations on e-commerce. Uh, we will have presentation on rule makers versus rule takers of digital economy. Uh, we will also talk about online platform liability and AI uh, liability. Uh, just very uh, briefly, um, the COVID-19 crisis has stimulated a surge uh, in the use of digital services uh, and convincingly demonstrated the glaring need to update uh, the trade rules. Um, as digital trade expands, governments are facing dilemmas between, on the one hand, maximizing uh, the opportunities staring from the digital trade, which is essential for innovation. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, managing the impact of cross-border uh, border, uh, data flows uh, for other policy objectives. Uh, having said that, significant, and may I say welcome, uh, achievement have been shaped by regional and bilateral uh, trade agreements, which are indicators for future trade negotiations. However, mm -hmm. the fragmentation of global governance in the digital economy is growing, may I say that. Uh, in exercising their regulatory powers, states effectively realize their digital sovereignty objectives. Um, uncertainties you know, surrounding divergent regulations, different uh, value preferences, different legal approaches at the local, uh, national, regional levels prevent the benefits of the digital economy uh, from fully uh, materializing. So uh, we have a great panel today. Uh, thank you everybody for being here. Please be aware that this session is being recorded. Uh, what we will do is that each of our, the speakers will give us their opening remarks about a minute. Uh, so we will have a broad overview of these issues and then we will have a deep dive on some of these issues and the panel will have some discussion and I will raise questions. And uh, after that, we will have time uh, to respond to the questions from the audience. Um, let me briefly introduce our panelists. Uh, I won't introduce the details. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me before, I'm Xin Pan. Uh, I'm a professor of law uh, at the National Tsinghua University. Uh, I'm a longtime CEO member and a former CEO vice president. Uh, now I would like to introduce the speakers in the order that they will appear and uh, speak. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Jingxia uh, Shi is a professor at the School of Law of the Renmin University of China. Uh, previously, uh, she served as a professor and the dean at a School of Law in China University of International Business and Economics. She got SJD from Yale. Uh, currently, she's a member of China Court of International uh, Commerce of the Supreme Court of China. Welcome to you, Jingxia. Um, Lucas Nawaro is a PhD student at the Doctoral School of uh, Social Sciences at the University of Warsaw uh, in the discipline of economics and finance. He is a graduate of data science and international economics at the Faculty of Economics uh, at the uh, University of Warsaw. Uh, he is now participate, uh, participating in the Horizon 2020 uh, project in Digital Economy Lab on the future of the internet. Um, Megalina Slowask let me try again. Uh, Megalina Slowaskaska, sorry, uh, is an associate professor in uh, the chair of European law at the Faculty of Law and Administration uh, of University of Warsaw, uh, where she also cooperates with Digital Economy Lab. Uh, she also works as an advisor to the European Union and the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Polish Senate. Welcome. Uh, after and uh, Han Weiliu is a senior lecturer of Manish University, uh, where he focuses on law, technology, and its implications for international economic law and the financial regulations. Um, he earned his PhD from the Graduate Institute in uh, Geneva. His works has appeared in top law journals. I would also like to add that uh, Han Wei is my former colleague at Tsinghua. Uh, welcome, Han Wei. 
Um, and finally, Meng Yi Wang is a PhD student, uh, uh, I mean, sorry, candidate uh, in uh, international law with minor uh, in economics at the Graduate Institute of Geneva. Uh, she uh, received, uh, received her JD from Harvard and Bachelor of Science with double majors in chemistry and philosophy uh, from University of Illinois. Uh, she um, mainly uses economics and quantitative method to study law and technology in addition to international economic, uh, economic law. Uh, welcome, Meng Yi. Um, unfortunately, uh, Aditi Pende cannot join us today uh, due to unforeseen professional obligations. So now, without further ado, uh, Jingxia, your topic is mainly on WTO plurilateral e-commerce negotiations, or maybe I should say joint statement initiative on e-commerce and China's participation. Um, what are the main issues in the WTO e-commerce uh, negotiations? I mean, what happened there? And what are the uh, positions of China in, uh, I mean, specific issues? Could we start with you for your introductory remarks? Jingxia, please. Okay, thank you so much, Xin Yi. Um, it's my great pleasure to speak at this panel. Uh, due to the time limitation, I will directly jump to uh, my uh, presentation. I will talk about just a little bit uh, on the background and then to uh, then uh, raise two arguments and one very recent concern. So as we, uh, most of us know, um, 76 WTO members, including the US, EU, and China, jointly launched a plurilateral negotiation on e commerce on, uh, Jan in January 2019 based on a so called joint initiative uh, statement, GSI, aiming to set up new rules for digital trade, ideally prior to the 12th. WTO ministerial conference to be scheduled in November later this year. With some members joining in the negotiation later on, right now we have uh, 86 members are currently uh, negotiating based on a consolidated text produced in December 2020, but with some proposals uh, or proposals revising uh, previous ones, such as the recent on telecommunication services submitted by EU, UK, uh, Norway, and Ukraine in April 2021. And fortunately, uh, I noticed that many documents in this negotiation are restricted to access for the public. It brings difficulties in learning about the whole picture of this negotiation right now. So uh, the, my first argument here is that uh, basically, I think the contours of a new deal are mainly shaped by uh, the key participants uh, of the negotiators. This paper, uh, my paper also argues that the US, EU, and China hold the key to the potential success or uh, success of GSI negotiation on e-commerce to a large extent. However, given the participants of e-commerce negotiations are very diversified now, including developed, developing as well as uh, least developed uh, uh, WTO members, it may add some uh, more difficulties to reach a, a compromise. I noted, for example, I note that uh, Nigeria recently made a proposal on flow of information, the concrete um, exact content is not available yet since it's re restricted uh, access the document. But it does remind me that all participants may bring forward their opinions on some issues they are interested in. So this may lead to more challenges for the negotiators to reach agreements on highly uh, already highly sensitive issues such as data flow, localization, and et cetera. Uh, so this is uh, the, the first uh, uh, background and uh, uh, my argument. Uh, I would like to have your uh, input. Secondly, as a key contributor on e-commerce discussions, the U.S. Uh, is seeking an ambitious high standard agreement from its proposal and the su suggestions. 
uh, China as the last minute entrant to this negotiation. Uh, uh, China has been consistently seen as opposing the major U.S. priorities and war. Um, uh, watching down any eventual outcome which may lead to an agreement, if any, with low, uh, so-called low-hanging fruits. Uh, I note that the 2020 consolidated text indicates that China does not express its views on the sensitive issues such as uh, cross-border data flow, uh, data localization, source code, and non-discriminatory treatment of digital products involving uh, permanent uh, uh, moratorium and the custom duties on electronic transmission and et cetera. So um, here is my argue, uh, second argument which is China's silence on this issue probably uh, is not nice, does not necessarily mean that China's participation in this negotiation opens the door for um, obstruction and a weak deal. Rather, China's participation creates meaningful space uh, given its important position. Uh, in the era of a digital economy for strategic engagement with uh, uh, key players such as US, EU, Japan, and et cetera, with respect to establishing urgently need the digital trade rule book. Therefore, China, I think, is not in a position to act as a riker due to the significant of uh, significance of this negotiation itself and the China's role to revive the WTO system, given its long-standing uh, preference for multilateralism. So uh, there are two points here. G first one, uh, given China's recent trade concluding practice, in particular ASAP, CHI, uh, which concerns e-commerce disciplines on data flow, the, lo uh, the location of uh, computing facilities and etc. So it's possible, I think, for China and other negotiators to reach some compromise on the above issues. Second, as long as there is some room to safeguard some policy concerns such as national security, internet safety, among others, it, it, it is also likely to turn in China from an assumed right to an important contributor to this negotiation, which may uh, uh, help all negotiators find a eventual landing zone for the participants. Uh, there are two arguments. I, uh, lastly, I do have a, a one, one concern resulting from the very recent uh, uh, DD event. So uh, we noticed that on uh, just about one week ago, DD choosing answer to writing hailing app in, in China received an alarming call from China's regulator, the uh, Cyberspace Administration of, of China, uh, CAC, warning DD that in one hour it will be uh, publicly ordered to stop sending up new users. So uh, as the question still swore about the situation, the CAC followed up its initial move to by ordering DD to remove its app from domestic app stores, seeing the company had violated laws on the collection of use and use of personal data. It also opened uh, investigation into two other uh, big Chinese companies that recently listed in the uh, United States. Um, three days ago, China declared a swiping crackdown on so-called illegal securities activities, in particular over cross-border transfers of sensitive issues. Uh, which is closely, I think, to some extent, to uh, to the current negotiation uh, on uh, e-commerce at uh, uh, under the WTO framework. So, in this battle, as uh, China said, the U.S. law on auditing listed companies passed uh, last December could result in uh, leaks of important data from China to the U.S. And the U.S. regards its regulation as necessary to ensure 
the health of its securities market. So the battle actually has put the Chinese company listed in the U.S. into a dilemma, or we can say. Among others, this is a classical uh, problem of cross-border data transfer, particularly because Didi is recognized as a key infrastructure operator in Chinese market. Um, I think this leads to a fair concern that the companies have to localize their data. This, for course, will make the WTO e-commerce negotiation harder to produce an uh, advanced set of rules to promote digital trade. I think um, in the week of time, I stop here um, currently, and I would like to, uh, all the panelists have more input, and uh, I would like to uh, respond to the question as well. Thank you. Shini, you have your microphone off. Sorry, uh, I mean, Jingxia, I will invite you to provide more uh, your insights about uh, later that uh, how China will uh, become an important uh, contributor to these negotiations and may help find a landing zone for all the participants later. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, so for the audience, uh, please feel free to put any questions uh, at this moment in the chat box. We will be coming back to you. And now, uh, Lucas and Megalina. Uh, further to Jingxia's uh, opening remarks, I would like to invite you to approach the topic from a particular angle, uh, rule makers and rule takers in digital economy. Uh, so Lucas, right? Uh, you will have eight minutes. Thank you. Uh, okay, so let me share my uh, screen. Uh, I hope you, uh, I hope you can see everything, uh, see the presentation and see and see the charts. Mm. Uh, not yet, not yet. Uh, it okay, try the share, uh, press the mm. share icon, then uh, select it. Okay. Yeah, okay. I think now it works. Mm. So the goal of our paper is to examine who are the role makers and the role takers in the area of digital economy in uh, international economic law. The focus of uh, this presentation is uh, innovative methodology based on text mining. Uh, text mining is uh, quantitative as opposed to qualitative analysis, which is more common in the legal area. Uh, however, we believe that the general picture is clear and conv convincing, especially as we uh, avoid black box methods and uh, each number I will present is possible to uh, explain. Um, this uh, novel methodology is crucial for analysis, so let me briefly uh, explain it. Uh, first, we transform all the documents, regional trade agreements, partnership agreements, and uh, free digital economy agreements uh, into a structured format suitable for automated analysis. Uh, we split the text into tokens. Uh, these tokens uh, are either words or punctuation marks. We join these tokens into groups of four, uh, which we will call n-grams from now on. Uh, these n-grams are basic units for further analysis. Uh, for example, in the Japan and Thailand RTA, the initial n-grams uh, in the preamble are preamble Japan and the, Japan and the kingdom, and the kingdom of, the kingdom of uh, Thailand. Uh, we classify each n-gram into precisely one of the groups. If the engram occurred for the first time in this particular LTA, uh, it can be assigned either to first occurrence if it was used again in another treaty later, or only occurrence uh, otherwise. A common engrams are uh, these engrams which were used more than 75 times. Uh, it allowed us to drop non-meaningful terms from the texts uh, while maintaining all the important engrams. Uh, an engram could be assigned to a country or an international organization, uh, which is a treaty side or a traditional rule maker. Uh, well, after preliminary analysis, uh, we decided to define six such rule makers 
uh, which are at least partially English speaking. So with the European Union, Canada, Australia, New Zealand and Singapore. Uh, so now let's move to the, to the, to the, to the results and this uh, particular example of a single trade deal. Uh, in this case, a recent uh, EU-Singapore uh, regional trade agreement. Uh, the percentages prove that the US, that the EU was the driving force behind the treaty, as a large part of engrams in quite many chapters are, or even a majority, are uh, either derived from EU's previous treaties or are these common uh, boilerplate terms. However, Singapore may have had input to some chapters, particularly uh, to the technical barriers of uh, trade, uh, to trade uh, 20 percent. Uh, provisions on government procurement are less of an original, original work by the EU than by the United States, uh, 10 percent versus uh, 18 percent, and uh, half of the chapter on non-tariff barriers to trade uh, has been negotiated for this particular treaty. Uh, so this is one example which is logical, which validates our methodology, like it passes all the sanity checks, everything which we would expect from, uh, from such a treaty. Uh, and uh, moving to the main topic of, the, of, uh, of this presentation, digital economy. Uh, it started to be introduced in the early 21st century and has grown so much in importance that some countries started signing separate agreements on it. Uh, here we have all the chapters on digital economy as well as free digital economy uh, agreements. Uh, the EU is shown as a leader mostly in its own agreements, uh, apart from RTI with Canada, which is a rule maker in its own right. No other traditional rule maker exceeds 8% of engrams. But the EU does not, uh, does not influence others. Uh, only two RTAs of other countries exceed 10% of EU's engrams, and in both cases, the United States is at least equally important. The United States, on the other hand, is uh, not is a lawmaker not only uh, for its own it is shown in the bottom of the chart, uh, but also for, uh, for example, Canada, for uh, Peru, or for South Korea, up to 30%. Uh, just like in other groups of chapters, non-rule makers draw heavily from existing treaties uh, of traditional rule makers. But an example of Singapore shows uh, that even smaller economies can influence rule making uh, if uh, they are creative and innovative enough. Uh, out of the first four e-commerce chapters, uh, three were in treaties signed by Singapore, so with uh, United States, uh, uh, Australia, uh, and uh, there was also an early signed uh, treaty between the United States and Australia. So there's a group of three countries uh, which uh, are leaders, uh, the United States, Australia and Singapore. But it cannot be said that the United States is the sole leader. For example, in uh, Thailand's treaties and uh, in Malaysia, Australia, uh, these two treaties are based on uh, Australia-Singapore uh, RTA, and uh, there is little consideration for rules made by the United States. Uh, we are obviously aware of some limitations in the methodology. Uh, in spite of the treaty being signed at the precise date as notified to the WTO, it may have been in negotiations uh, for quite some time. Uh, for example, the EU-Japan deal had a draft version published when Turkey and Singapore signed an RTA. Uh, so some chapter, so some chapters uh, which are pro have probably been negotiated uh, by the EU or Japan were shown to be. Um, Singapore was shown to be influential in them, and also this analysis is quantitative. So if there is a short provision which is uh, important. Um, it uh, the, the percentages grow just by a little bit so we are aware that it needs to be augmented with expert uh, knowledge uh, thank you thank you uh lucas uh, i do hope we will have time for you later to elaborate uh, your methodology but now i would like to uh turn to more um 
specific uh, issues focusing on the uh, challenges facing the sectoral regulators. Let's first talk about media content regulation. Han Wei, um, your paper addresses the issue of online platform content liability. Uh, liability. And uh, um, in particular, the trade rules regarding uh, interactive computer services under the USMCA and the US-Japan uh, Digital Trade Agreement, which has uh, exempted uh, social media from uh, defamation standards applicable to traditional media. And obviously, uh, such a provision is based on the U.S. First Amendment and the Communications Decency Act. So Han Wei, uh, you argue that it's unwise for the USTR to export the same provision in future negotiations. We would like to hear uh, your argument and the perspectives. Han Wei. Um, thanks very much, um, Professor Pong. And it's my great pleasure to see many old friends here because I I haven't been able to um, go back to Europe since I moved down to Australia. It's too far for me to travel um, <laughs> for over like a 30 hours flight. So it's one of the good benefits I can think of out of the COVID is everything now goes online. Okay, so um, before I begin my presentation, just give you a, uh, a quick question. I mean, what if I made a kind of um, defamation statement against my friend Meng Yi on Facebook? Then if Meng Yi thinks that this is not true and it's defamation statement, and can Meng Yi demands the Facebook or Twitter to remove the such a content? And what if Facebook refused to honor such a request? Can Meng Yi sue Facebook for torts or other civil liabilities. Or if Facebook decides to honor Moni's request, then can I sue Facebook or Twitter for my speech being removed? Cool. Okay, so you might wonder what's the relevance of such a scenario to the international trade law? Okay. So here's the thing. I mean, back in um, 2017 and 2018, the US in its new um, um, free trade agreements, namely um, the USNCA and the US-Japan Digital Trade Agreement, the USTR has exported its um, Communication Decency Act, um, Section 230, namely CDA 230. And the CDA 230 is by and large mirror um, the, sorry, the CDA 230 is by and large mirrored in this trade agreement um, through Article 17.19 um, 17, 17 and also Article um, 18 of the US Japan DTA. So the result is that um, under these two trade agreements, the trading partners of the U.S. have to follow the U.S. type of regulation. So in such a scenario, that means Facebook does not have to remove or remove the content. And no matter what, the Facebook would not be held liable for civil liabilities for removing, moderating, or otherwise. So my, my paper tried to figure out a couple of questions. So the first question is, where does this, what I call intermediate immunity clause come from? And I traced the legislation, I mean, the negotiation history, and I found that this is pretty much just copy and paste with some minor variation from the US CDA 230. But because of its underlying sensitive nature of CDA 230, the US, when it exports such a closed, it downplay the role of this new arrangement by using a very 
humble title, a modest title called interactive computer service, which you know, you would never know what it means if you don't really uh, have a deep dive into its background. And this is in a sharp contrast to what we have seen in the um, DMCA context where the US would never shy um, by calling this, by using safe harbor um, when it comes to the intermediary liabilities um, in the copyright infringement context. So the second question is, what are the impacts, if any, on Canada, Mexico, and Japan? In the paper, I argue that this new arrangement is not as powerful or sweeping as it appears to be, at least not in the case of Mexico or Japan, because these two countries have put in place a lot of carve-outs and qualifications, which essentially um, cancel as much as the effect of this new provision. For instance, in Japan's side later, both parties confirmed that Japan has no obligations to impose, to um, introduce a new legislation because of this new arrangement. And both parties confirms that the existing Japanese law as passed in 2001 is consistent with what both parties have agreed. However, if you look at the, the Japanese law, the Intermediary um, Liability Act in, in 2001, the actually the, the Japanese approach is totally different from the CDA 230. And similarly, you can see um, the Mexico, the Mexico government actually um, put a very powerful, a very big carve, carve out saying that the Mexico government will only comply with the, this a, agreement to the extent that it, it is consistent with Article 6 and Article 7 of the Mexico constitutional law, which talks about freedom of speech and freedom of information. The only exception is Canada. Canada imposed pretty much zero carve out. And according to some of the Canadian um, leading tech law scholars, this is a welcome addition because in Canada, they address the online defamation issue through traditional common law approach, which is strict liabilities as applied to these internet providers. That's way too strict and that's not good for Canadians to attract foreign companies. And this is good for them to, um, to create a level playing field to compete with US. So Canada is the only exception. So this leads us to the next question. Why did the US adapt such a soft approach toward its trading partners. If US was so serious in exporting such a new arrangement, it should take it should have taken a hard line approach by minimizing the qualifications as much as they can. But this is not what we see in this trade negotiation. So my argument in the paper is that the primary modification is not so much to buy its trading partner, but rather by exporting such a new arrangement, the US government is trying to lock itself with the existing CDA 230 because there are so many controversies around this, this, um, this legislation and the both parties try to kind of um, try to reform this controversial statute. So my next argument in the paper is that how far the US government can go 
to export and to diffuse its CDA 230 as a new global norm through trade negotiation. I'd identified two possible boundaries. One, internally, for the past like two um, or five years or so, we have seen lots of proposals coming to, um, has been put in place in, in the house. And as, as of this writing, there are over 20 bills sitting in the Congress. So if, if Biden administration is really serious to reform the city at 230, and Biden should at least think about whether or not it is good strategies to um, for USDR uh, to... Uh, Hanwei, you are running out of time, so wrap up. Okay, okay, sure. So, so the the inter internal boundaries is a, is a about the internal politics in the U.S. to talk about the, the reform of City at two thirty, and this would be a crucial um, limitations that for the U.S. governments to push forward this new arrangement. And externally, you can see uh, that this new arrangement is incompatible with other regulatory models especially in China and the European Union. So um, I conclude that I don't think, and I am uh, against the exporting such a arrangement through trade negotiation, because even though we agree free trade agreement, I mean, free speech is a fundamental human right, but there are different pathways to achieve this, um, this freedom of speech and different pathways reflect its unique social, economic, political values. So I don't think it's a good idea to export such a new clothes that comes from the American values and deeply rooted in the First Amendment. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Han Wei. A very interesting presentation. Uh, you will have opportunity to elaborate your argument in the panel uh, discussion later. Uh, now, uh, turning to Meng Yi, uh, we would like to hear your uh, insight on AI product. Yes, Hello. Hi. Um, well, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I want to do three things today. The first is to situate the discussion. Ah, good. Okay. Um, so I want to do three things today. The first is to situate the discussion today more within the framework of transnational law and comparative law. And second, I want to introduce the relevant forms of torts and discern some of the patterns um, that are now emerging in commentaries and country proposals about what to do with AI liability. And third, I will use economic analysis of law to critique these patterns. Um, one note on methodology, and I'm sure I will elaborate on this later with focus in particular. Um, economic analysis of law um, generally does three things. Um, the first is to predict the incentives um, that can be created by legal systems to have precise uh, testable hypothesis and then to link it with what exactly can be tested empirically. So generally you have a model and then there's experiments to isolate some of the things you want to test and then you put it within the context of big data like Lucas has been doing and then have a continuing um, uh, feedback loop within these three types of approaches. Okay. Um, I will begin by uh, situate us in the more transnational framework. Um, so um, transnational law has always been in international lawmaking, just that, for instance, in the 1960s have been talking about it. And there are different mechanisms of transnational law where domestic law matters a great deal on the global stage. And uh, it involves different kinds of actors. Um, private actors have been particularly active in this regard through private standard setting, for instance, through contracts such as arbitration and courts. In the context of AI, for instance, 
Tesla has been testing itself um, driverless cars in different countries. And in the case of collision in China, the case was resolved based on contracts. And um, another collision that happened in Japan is now being litigated by the, the relatives of the deceased victim in the court in California because of the choice of law provisions there. So domestic law matters a great deal. And another way that um, domestic law diffuses through, throughout different jurisdictions is this public, um, public um, it's a contemporary legal transplantation basically. So legal innovations, when it cannot be diffused through trade agreements, often um, the, the regulators learn from each other and experiments. So for instance, with the case of GDPR, the data protection of EU, was picked up uh, about three years later by California. And uh, California also innovated with a few other de de uh, provisions. And that those innovative provisions and GDPR, the chunk of them, are now transported in other states. So I hope I've made the case for studying domestic law and comparative law um, when it comes to innovative uh, legal issues. Now I will share my slides and I will be quick so that we will have some time for um, discussion. Okay. Can you see my slides? Oh, okay. Um, so there are two, um, Okay, there are three types of torts that are relevant in this context, and you, you can find it in the US, you can find it in the EU, you can find it a little bit in China. Um, the system in the US and US slightly more similar in that um, it's not very harmonized um, in the EU, um, except for the case of product liability uh, directive. Um, a lot of the strict liability and negligence still happens at the member state. Level. Similarly, in the US, most of the torts are state law. There's no uniform federal tort law. Um, there, um, I've discerned three patterns in the existing discussion of what to do with AI liability when an accident happens. What should we do? Um, there are three types of proposals that generally map onto these three categories, and each has their deficiencies. So the first one is product liability. Um, a lot of people jump to product liability thinking it's the one or the exclusive way of fixing accident liability. And that is incorrect because it's under-inclusive. Under product liability only governs products. Um, and any trade lawyer would be very familiar with the goods and service divide. So a lot of the service is not covered under product liability. So the US law is very clear that a dentist, for instance, who uses a defective product in um, serving a, a, a patient or a pharmacist who distributes a drug that is defective are not held as a distributor in the sense of product liability. So you still have to get these people who provide service through strict liability and negligence. The second type of strict liability, the second proposal focuses on strict liability, sometimes with the addition of some form of compulsory insurance. Um, the rationale for this type of argument, both by countries and by commentators, is that you can analogize AI to one of the categories of strict liability. So it's either employer employee, it could be animals, or it's inherently abnormally dangerous. Um, I argue that uh, this is incorrect because it ignores the de deterrence function of tort law. Um, and I will say a little bit more about that. Um, and also when it comes to the assumption that somehow insurance will magically arise to face the challenge of AI's incorrect, history is littered with examples where there is not, when there is a new product, um, and when the insurance market cannot stabilize, the, the manufacturer cannot really buy insurance and therefore gets out of the market. So there are two challenges that are in particular with respect to AI for insurance purpose. First is the lack of historical data to assess risk frequency and severity in order for insurance companies to set the premium. And the other issue is adverse selection, which is um, a problem that's often in um, that's often um, 
occurs in the case of information asymmetry. So adverse selection happens when the buyer has more information about the product than the seller of insurance, for instance. So for a seller of insurance, they will not be able to tell which car is safer. Is it Tesla, is it Google or Uber? And therefore they will set um, a price that's the same for all of them, which will not provide the right incentive for the car companies to take care. So anecdotal evidence based on my interview is that it, it is in, indeed the case right now that some insurance companies are setting the same price of the product group regardless of the safety level because they just don't have any. The other thing that has been ignored uh, in the debate between negligence and strict liability is the activity level. So how often as a society do you want physicians to use AI medical imaging, right? So the, the, when it comes to negligence, the reasonableness is defined assessed through per unit of activity. And therefore negligence doesn't care if the physician uses the same AI medical imaging device, for instance, a thousand times a month or just once a month. And so negligence then places a burden on the victim instead of inducing the physician to take proper care to internalize the risk of accidents. And on the other hand, strict liability then places the burden on the injurer to take proper care and internalize the risk. Um, I will conclude on the, the selection of legal instruments and institutions, since this is often um, mentioned, but never really explored in the relevant uh, literature. So there has been a lot of discussion about what is the proper legal instrument or institution for regulating AI liability do you want to do it through a standard? Do you want to do it through a sweeping regulation? And some people, especially those from common law backgrounds, just believe negligence will just catch up. Reasonableness has always, has always um, changed over time. So the economic analysis of law literature has treated this selection as balancing or calculating the ex ante cost of norm specification and ex post cost of norm adjudication. So in civil law countries, for instance, the law on the books are much more specific compared to a common law country. And therefore the fixed cost, the ex ante cost of norm sophistication is much higher than a common law country. And yet um, in common law country, because there's a lot of more standards and reasonableness, what is reasonable, that has resulted in a lot of adjudication. And therefore the variable cost, every time you adjudicate something, the variable cost is, is bigger because there's more gray room, there's more uncertainty, it's not very specific. When it comes to the case of AI, the variable cost is extremely high. For each, um, for each adjudication, the courts probably have to hire experts and in a very adversarial context, such as in the US, both sides will have their experts to debate what was the causation, was there actually a defect? And so there, it may not be worth it to um, have such a large variable cost and it may be prudent to have some of this cost and Fung go have Fung the anti-cost, uh, ex ante regulation. Feng Yi, Feng Yi. Yes. It's uh, out of time, yeah, sorry. I just finished, so. Okay, thank, thank you, thank you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, you can you can hear me, right? Because I kind of lost you. Okay, okay, good. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, uh, I, I think your presentation raised the question of uh, regulatory uh, fragmentation, and it can be a very good starting point for our panel discussion. But before that, uh, Jingxia, Jingxia, are you there? Jingxia? Jingxia, uh, would you like to come in? Uh, Come in on uh, Gabriel Gary's question. Jingxia. Okay, let's keep that. Um, hello? Yep, let's keep that. Um, so um, let's have more discussions. Uh, so we already have many questions coming in. Uh, Lucas. 
Lucas, would you like to respond to the questions regarding methodology, just very briefly? We have you have several uh, questions. Yeah, just very briefly. Thank you. Uh, of course. So uh, first, uh, to Wojciech Giemza, um, what language software have you used? Uh, we used uh, Python. Um, yeah. We did not have to do much scraping because uh, uh, we built on work by uh, by uh, Al Schneid who uh, who published uh, their who, who published the texts of uh, of treaties in a structured way uh, but the little scraping we needed to 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 do was made with uh, with also with python using the selenium uh, library mm. but if, if anyone wants to do this in r it's it's probably the same this is not very this is not very complex or very language specific uh, the second question about uh, dictionary analysis and filtering. Mm, well, in, in the legal area, some words which are stop words have a very different meaning. For example, you cannot just drop words like and and, and all uh, because it like totally changes what uh, uh, what the what the provision says. And in previous experience, uh, we uh, I. I preferred to uh, use the domain specific uh, stop words, which uh, essentially meant limiting uh, the limiting the number of maximum occurrences or the maximum number of documents in which uh, uh, a word can uh, can can occur. Uh, if anyone is familiar with scikit-learn or count vectorizer, it also has. Uh, uh, a, 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 a parameter which 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 you can use. Uh, it's max df. Mm, uh, about the model RTAs. Mm, I think that's a very interesting question because mm, I would say that this is possible, but there is one caveat. So uh, yeah, we computed uh, we computed the most common terms. We computed the most common provisions. Mm, and uh, together with uh, some published uh, AI language models like GPT-3 or GPT-J6B, you definitely can uh, uh, write a prompt. Uh, so, for example, uh, e chapter of e-commerce in an RTA uh, between US and China, which doesn't exist, uh, and it could theoretically with perfect with a good uh, parameter settings it could generate you a uh, reasonably uh, reasonably reasonably good uh, good example uh, but uh, definitely it does not mean that uh, lawyers in the area of international economic law will be uh, automated out of out of existence because the corpus is uh, to the corpus is too small to to do this well so yeah it, it, it could be a very interesting exercise but uh, it i wouldn't say that it's uh, that it's uh, useful uh, and to the last question from the uh, ladrigo um, we unfortunately used only uh, could, could just only treaties which are available in in english because well it's one once again uh, uh, a problem with uh, with small data so uh, it would be rather difficult to um, to make any conclusions from uh, from just the the very small number of treaties which are available in in spanish and uh, the Obviously, there are problems with translation. You well, automated translation is not perfect. You can go to uh, to you can go more literal translation or less literal translation. Uh, so the, 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 it uh, even even if we had uh, had a good uh, a really good translator translates translates possibility of translation, it uh, would still need uh, more assumptions. Uh, so we okay. wanted as little yeah. as possible. Thank, yeah. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jinxia, would you like to come in on Gabriel Gary's question? Uh, yes. 
So uh, first, I would like to uh, thanks a lot for Gary's question, uh, which touches upon a very fresh topic, is reform of WTO, particularly on the revival of its uh, negotiating uh, functions. I have uh, three points here. First, uh, I think the GSI negotiations, um, right now we have five such negotiations recognize the WTO's relevance and importance to uh, shape the future of international trade and also this play an underlying resilience in the system and its uh, members. So together with other four GSI negotiations, the negotiation on e-commerce is also of great significance and could be uh, uh, even seen as a potential game changer for the WTO whose Negotiating, uh, negotiating functions have been faced with many challenges in recent decades, in addition to uh, its, uh, the difficulties of its di uh, dispute settlement mechanism. Uh, second point uh, I would like to make is that despite the controversial arguments put forward by India uh, and South Africa in uh, this March, uh, the, basically, they are questioning the legitimacy of these uh, GSI negotiations and their outcome in the future, if, if any. Uh, mainly because, you know, uh, the launch of this GSI negotiation did not obtain uh, consensus of all WTO members. However, at this moment, I do think it was truly important for the WTO members to revive WTO's negotiating function is that they need to or even have to take action, certain action, finding a workable solution or workable way to do something. Um, third, against this by, uh, background or backdrop, in terms of the outcome of GSI negotiations and how they uh, coexist with other instruments, existing uh, instruments uh, within the WTO framework, what's the position or status of this outcome uh, if they can be uh, reached in the future? I'm currently, uh, frankly speaking, I'm currently uh, not quite sure what's the right avenue to giving effect, legal effect to the GSI negotiating outcomes. Uh, there's some uh, problems with using like additional uh, uh, commitments, uh, Article uh, 18 in members' schedule of commitments. Um, I think there's some problem with this suggestion because at, after all, this suggestion also needs or requires the consensus uh, of all WTO members as well. So in this respect, uh, uh, I noted that uh, various academic views on the issue have been recently, uh, basically from like uh, last year or year before last and this year as well, have been uh, uh, put forward. But I do think none of them right now works very perfectly. Part of the reason lies in the fact that this is not only just a legal issue or technical issue, but also uh, up to the political wills of WTO member to a large extent. Um, regardless of this being said, however, I'm still positive that WTO members will finally find a appropriate avenue uh, in the future. After all, I still I deem the GSI negotiation on e-commerce together with other GSI negotiations as well to uh, uh, to counter the fragmentation uh, of uh, rule, uh, trade rulemaking uh, currently. To echo the topic of this session, I also think GSI negotiation uh, on e-commerce to some extent can counter the fragmentation of digital trade rules making. Uh, thank you so much for your question yeah. again. Uh, I hope my uh, answer helps a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jingxia, uh, for your very uh, insightful viewpoint. Megalina, uh, 
why don't we have more discussion on the role of the European Union and the United States in the rule making process? Um, in in your paper, you, you you pointed out that the traditional superpowers do not uh, lose their significant position uh, in the international economic law creation. Uh, certainly, I, I think uh, there's no doubt that the U.S. preserve their unique role of a uh, rule maker. Um, but let's talk more talk more about the the role of the European Union. Um, in, my, in my view, my, from the GDPR to the proposals of Digital Services Act, Digital Market Act, well, the the EU has been uh, leveraging its economic muscle. Uh, for a leadership role uh, in shaping the international standards for the digital economy. So what are the uh, findings in uh, your study in this regard? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Xinyi, for your question. Uh, I think that the problem with the EU is uh, that uh, to some extent uh, it has completely different priorities than uh, US and than China. And you can clearly see it not only in internal regulations of the EU like GDPR and uh, I really do believe that the EU is spreading its uh, attitude towards um, data protection not through RTAs but through um, decision on decisions on adequacy uh, based on GDPR uh, but um, in our study um, we've seen that uh, it's not like the EU is um, abandoning its uh, role as a rule maker, uh, but uh, it was previously a uh, rule maker for its own treaties and um, and it even strengthened that uh, pattern in um, digital economy. Uh, so the way the EU um, structures uh, its uh, there is a cat somewhere. Uh, the the way <laughs> sorry, it's, Go on, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the the way the EU structures its um, its provisions in RTAs uh, is usually copied uh, in its own in its other RTAs, uh, but not necessarily uh, used in uh, third countries uh, RTAs. So we can see uh, the sort of split models. Uh, the one is uh, created by US and uh, and the triangle uh, Wukash mentioned in um, his, uh, his in his introduction. We, uh, we managed to see that there is a triangle between Australia, Singapore and uh, US. They created first uh, chapters on um, digital economy and provisions are copied. Uh, while the EU is um, creating its uh, own uh, its own model, so it is uh, to some extent the answer for fragmentation. So there is some risk, although there are many provisions that are really really similar. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Maybe we move to uh, Han Wei and Meng Yi, okay? Um, I have a question for you. <laughs> uh, but of course, other speakers are uh, welcome to respond to it. Uh, it seems that both uh, of your presentations address uh, important issues on uh, how to regulate new technologies. Uh, uh, Meng Yi addressed uh, the AI product liability, while Han Wei uh, talked about the digital media content uh, regulation. Um, Meng Yi, would you like to provide more um, comparative analysis, in particular uh, from the you know uh, transnational perspectives, uh, perhaps also focus on the competition among jurisdictions? There's definitely a lot of regulatory competition right now, um, both in terms of who's the first mover and therefore the template will be uh, adopted, which happened in the case of GDPR, um, or in the case of um, um, other um, other areas like tax where you have risk to the bottom. So both could happen and we don't yet know um, how this will play out in the case of AI yet. Okay. Um, how about uh, Han Wei? Uh, um, if I can if I can just push a little bit further on on, on, on this point that um, 
as you have pointed out that you know the the the, the us has sort of limited the the liability of the uh, internet service provider um um and uh to in line with the uh, section uh, 220 of the uh, decency act um i um as I mentioned earlier that, you know, on the other side of Atlantic, uh, the, the draft digital service act and um, I mean, the, the EU tried to modernize the EU uh, e-commerce di directive, which set the liability uh, rules uh, to online content. And uh, some EU leader uh, even expressed the urgent need to, you know, clear uh, for more clear uh, regulation on online content. So I, I guess my question is, uh, in your view, although the proposals of the EU Digital Services Act is being discussed and it may take years to uh, to uh, before the rules become effective, um, will it further uh, fragment? Uh, the digital landscape. Uh, you can answer this question from uh, in a broader uh, context. For example, uh, the current EU and the US approaches toward uh, digital platforms. Okay. Um, thanks very much, <clears throat> Professor Pong. And maybe I, I just um, also um, briefly re respond to um, um, Professor um, Weber's um, one of very quick comments. Yeah. So um, when it comes to public morals, yes, um, um, in the USMCA annex, um, in the annex adapted by Mexico, um, in the last paragraph, they talk about they will incorporate Article 32 of the USMCA, which talks about um, the public moral. And that refers back to Gates Agreement, um, Article um, 14. And when it comes to, they can talk about um, whenever necessary, they can invoke public moral as a defense to regulate content regulation. So that's right. So that's a, uh, thanks very much for pointing out that um, key issue. And for, um, for the EU, I think I'm fighting a a confrontation, sort of confrontation between US and EU um, when it comes to online online speech regulation. Well, some of the socialistic, I, I, I look at some, some of the socialist or social legal studies, they talk about that um, if we look at the Twitter or Facebook online speech policies, in the past couple of years, they by and large reflect the American value um, to promote freedom of speech. And that is by and large in line with their First Amendment concept. Starting from around like um, 2016, the EU has uh, rolled out a voluntary code of conduct for certain major platforms such as Twitter, um, Microsoft and Google and Facebook, they subscribe to it. And in that document, they have to sort of subscribe to the European value in terms of some hate speech is not and should not be allowed on their platform. So you see, it's still a balancing act and I can see the struggle um, for these online platform companies between the EU and the US. So in a way, the US is trying to leverage and by records kind of um, exporting its freedom of speech and its regulatory model through in international trade agreement, although in a much softer way, in a sense that you still allowed certain leeway for its trading partners. On the other, if you can think about the European model and the, the EU is leading the ways to kind of cut back um, hate speech and also like disinformation, misinformation, and also take a layer approach toward these online platform companies by imposing a very honest obligations onto the very large platform. And the new EU in a way is exercising or 
exercising its power and that we can see again the Brussels effect in the next couple of years. And that will, I think that would pretty much um, determine the emerging contour of online um, content regulation. However, um, that being said, we have to think about the US proposals. There are lots of proposals which also reflect that the U, U, the Americans want to kind of reflect upon their own approach. They are too, well, too much tolerant toward these online platform companies. So they are also thinking about um, more onerous procedures like a due process or transparency requirements as imposed um, onto these online platform companies. So in a way, you can see there is a little bit convergence, but still, I. It's a very controversial, U.S. to kind of to overhaul the CDA two two thirty because they still are very kind of obsessed about their First Amendment right. So that's my um, overview of this um, the 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 future trend. Yep. Okay, thank you very much, Han Wei. We actually have a very uh, active uh, discussion in the chat box, uh, especially uh, between Professor Yang and Thomas, uh, my dear friend. Uh, so, uh, if I may, I think we just respond to the questions there. Uh, but let me add that uh, I think, uh, yes, uh, obviously, uh, uh, the there's a, I mean, a high standard bro agreement with deeper uh, commitment may 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 hinder particip uh, participants who are not yet willing or able to uh, accept the obligations. But on the other hand, I mean, a, a, a narrow agreement with limited scope will likely uh, you know, retain the greatest number of negotiation participants, but including China, but it could have less impact on digital trade if it does not address important issues. So um, as we can see in the uh, chat box, I, th I think the question is, uh, in reality, I mean, different models for digital trade or as Marcus pointed out, the data governance are emerging and the different models, you know, followed by the key players will be the, can I say, barrier to an international agreement which requires sufficient political dynamics, if not consensus, but at least the sufficient political momentum and political dynamics. So the key question here is how to negotiate a, a compromise given the associated concern. And in this regard, uh, I will turn to you again that uh, uh, to what extent does China's position in the RCEP and perhaps also uh, China uh, EU comprehensive agreement on investment uh, signify a transformation, for example, uh, on the issue of data localization? Thank you, Shen Yi. Yes, we, we do have a very uh, active uh, discussions um, on GSI negotiation. Uh, I'd like to first respond a little bit about that. Uh, here, there are actually there are two questions. One is more substantive, which is about how to, uh, how to read compromise on uh, very sen highly sensitive issues such as data flow, uh, data localization, source code, uh, non-discriminatory of digital uh, goods. Uh, those are more substan substantive issues for, th for the negotiation. But in addition to that, there is a, a more like procedural issue. If the negotiation, uh, not only GSI negotiation on e-commerce, but also, you know, uh, with other four GSI negotiations on domestic regulation service, no, do, domestic regulations, uh, MSIMEs, uh, and, and some other as well. So the question uh, here, hardly debated in recent years, is that if the can, uh, if the participants of GSI negotiations can finally reach agreement, uh, but. 
the question is how for uh, how these uh, agreements uh, can be integrated into the existing WTO framework because the launch of this GSI negotiation did not uh, obtain the, the consensus of w, all WTO members. So this is really, you know, I, I think a very uh, important question worthy of more attention and more discussions. Uh, but as I said, right now, I have no exact idea, uh, definite idea, uh, what's the avenue for, for this GSI outcomes, if any, to be integrated uh, into the WTO framework. One uh, idea uh, also, you know, corresponding to what I have been thinking it might be, you know, um, since WTO members have to do something, uh, taking uh, e-commerce e as an example. Otherwise, you know, WTO negotiating function uh, basically come to a stop uh, to a large extent. So I, I think GSI negotiation, even with some, uh, uh, you know, uh, not very perfect, but they are they are providing an avenue for some WTO members to negotiate in something. So uh, in terms of the outcome, I think we now we probably we need to uh, lead the issue uh, to the future. I'm still I'm positive on uh, on WTO members finally figuring out a way uh, for this outcome to to coexist. Uh, uh, with the WTO framework. Uh, okay. Turning yeah, to thank the you. question... Uh, quickly, the just, just very yeah, quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, this is very important, you know, if we look at how China's uh, con uh, treaty concluding uh, practice, uh, taking the ASEP uh, and the CHI, EU-China uh, Comprehensive Agreement on Investment as examples. So the ASEP chapter 12, uh, which is entitled the e-commerce, allowing a cross-border data flow of uh, 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 cross-border data flow. And the CHI even allows very uh, highly sensitive financial uh, information uh, transfer uh, uh, cross-border between U.S. and China, even though, uh, you know, the, the ASEP, uh, the Chapter 12 of ASEP is not subject to the treaty's uh, dispute uh, settlement mechanism. And the CHI, the prospect of CHI's entry into force uh, has some problems. But, th but I, I, I do think, you know, um, this two agreements contains very important disciplines, you know, for CHI, in, in the case of CHI, they, con they incorporate very strong disciplines on the liberalization of services market, SOEs, and the sustainable development. Um, I think behind this, we should see China's desire to open more to the outside uh, world and keep it abreast of most advanced international economic and and the uh, trade rules on the other hand we also notice that uh, okay. the yeah. us has retreated its stance on pushing very strong disciplines in data okay. data localization and emphasize national security in a wide sense so taking all these very interesting factors into consideration i do think we we have a lot to observe Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Tamisha. Thank you. Yeah, because, because um, we actually, we actually, I, I think we, we still have five minutes left, but I think it, it's time to wrap up here. Um, I would like to invite uh, Meng Yi, uh, Megalina, and uh, Han Wei, okay, if you like, to make a very brief concluding remarks, if you want. Uh, Megalina, why what, what, what don't we start with you? Okay, thank you. Um, I have several comments uh, to, um, uh, to what uh, Xinxia, um, if I pronounce uh, well. Yes, yes, Xinxia, yes. Uh, okay. First of all, I, I think that uh, creation, even plurilateral uh, agreement is crucial from the point of view of uh, creating a model uh, agreement. 
And I wonder whether the very narrow agreement will be the slow hanging fruit you mentioned. Uh, it's like we left all those uh, controversial things like source code regulation or data, um, government data uh, to to the wild, I mean, uh, to, to freely uh, regulate uh, and uh, not creating a good model. Uh, that's one comment. And the other thing is that I think uh, that uh, we are on a bridge of uh, creation, th these data which are not ready to be regulated, um, as uh, someone mentioned in uh, our comment sections. Uh, I think that they are ready partially, and that's exactly what Kai said, although I do not really believe that Kai is entering into force uh, in any foreseeable future. Um, that we can uh, translate data uh, into treaties, but small fragments of data, like financial data or health data, things like that, and we do not have a space for uh, any regulatory model uh, for uh, broader view and I think that that's all what I have time to say although the topic is really interesting. Thank you Megari. Uh, Meng Yi, would you like to? Uh, thank yeah. you. Um, I would like to just point out that there are certain issues that should be governed at different levels and having some competition and regulatory experimentation are extremely important especially for emerging technologies. Um, and even when, you know, we have investment that have different tribunals where they compete with their rules, it's also healthy. There doesn't have to be a monopoly of rules and having different issues being tested and competed on different levels is actually a healthy thing. Okay, thank you very much. Han Wei? Um, yes, I, I think I just pretty much agree among um, EM, some of the commentators like Thomas and the Professor Yang, um, they talk about if we want to um, go deeper then when it comes to the trade, digital trade agreements, you have to be very sensitive as to um, the local values. And uh, you have to think about an other alternatives that is much less um, intrusive. And we can like, adapt a more um, experimental approach by engaging each other through um, informal dialogue, um, through MOUs or like some of the forums such as APAC or OECD as a first, first place of, um, of contact to begin um, the dialogue and to um, push forward the formal um, treaty reforms in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Han Wei. Uh, I'm going to close this session. Uh, we are very grateful to have all of you uh, joining us today for this session. So thank you very much and goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.